Okay, the last installment of, well, actually the third or fourth uh, installments, but you're not going to see part four ever, probably, um, unless you um, allow me to continue next week, which I don't want to do. <laughs> so today, today then, I'm going to talk about uh, work that in part um, connects with uh, Richard, um, who's in the audience here. Um, Richard and I and uh, a postdoc, Maddie Jalali, who have been doing some simulations of spherical shallow water turbulence um, with uh, rotation. So this is what leads to then these banded circulation patterns that we're seeing that are conspicuous patterns that are seen in especially the outer planetary circulations. Um, using a shallow water model, I'm not going to get into the um, pros and cons of this. It's a fiercely debated subject about whether one should consider Jupiter and these outer atmospheres as being deep or shallow. Uh, both models have, or both groups of, I feel like camps, I'd say, um, have claimed to have results that reproduce jets that form on these planets using a deep atmosphere or a shallow water atmosphere. Um, the surprising thing is that a shallow water um, simulation, which is probably the simplest thing you can do, nonetheless reproduces um, features that are reminiscent, I would say, maybe not completely realistic, but uh, at least suggestive of the kinds of structures you see on these in these outer planetary circulations. So it's a nonetheless fundamental geophysical fluid dynamics interest to understand um, in the simplest context. And this is not, this is old work in the sense that there have been probably between 100 and 1,000 papers now written on, on jet formation, a lot of things in shallow water geometry. There were early works in um, using the so-called barotropic vorticity equation which is an extreme limit of these equations, which is the easiest one. Um, Gareth Williams was doing work of this, and probably in the when I knew him, I was fortunate enough to actually see him as a PhD student in Princeton at the time. So he was my first year's advisor, if you like, before Ray Pierre and Barrett came along um, and never saw me again after three years. But <laughs> anyway, um, but so I worked with Gareth Williams briefly, but uh, he was doing some work on, on Jupiter. He was interested in Jupiter's atmosphere and doing some simulations of uh, force dissipative flows in the barotropic vorticity equation, um, interested in jet formation. Um, at that time, uh, Peter Rines and other people around trying to explain how the turbulence somehow organized itself to produce jets. And so we now have uh, a word that's come down. I'm not going to talk about the Rines length here. That could be another uh, talk altogether. Um, we have Richard and I together have written actually a review article, well, not really a review article, but an article in um, a book on zonal jets, um, which has a lot of this uh, detail in it. It's not now that the jet, the book is maybe three years old, it's maybe not up to, to date now, but uh, largely uh, we tried to cover what was taking place and the problem is complicated. Um, in this specific application, um, um, there are a number of parameters. I'm not going to get into them just yet so that keep things simple to begin with and then gradually get more complicated. But I'll try to give you a little bit of history. So um, when I say a brief history, I mean a very brief history um, of planetary shallow water flows. Some of the history I'm giving just by talking um, randomly now, but uh, it is actually a long history, but I can't, uh, I'd be here all day if I were just talking about uh, what people have been doing in the subject. But there's a Japanese group, um, Yod and other people have been doing uh, many studies on this um, um, type of flow and, um, ensembles of calculations trying to study jets and equatorial jets in particular in some cases. Um, so there, I'll, I'll point out some things that features that um, are a bit controversial or uncertain still in terms of um, what we're seeing. I'm not claiming that this is a realistic um, model for the outer planets, okay? So this is just a, a model um, that we can learn something in geophysical fluid dynamics. It's a model that spontaneously forms jets. And jets is the main thing I'm going to talk about today. So jets has been in my, in my set of titles all week long, and this is the first day I've actually been able to really talk about a jet. Um, so here we're going to see jets all the time. Um, and the towards the end of this, if I get there, probably in the second hour, um, there's a really nice uh, analysis that you can do for um, a single jet. Um, and uh, the image I had up here before um, these are, this is actually relative vorticity on a sphere and um, looking in orthographic projection. These blue-red regions here with the waves on them 
are jets, basically. They're wavy jets that appear. Um, th another issue which um, I'll bring up is the, their waviness, um, which has maybe not been commented on as much in, in previous work. Um, but wavy jets um, seems to be, seem to be generic here. Um, so I'll talk about the physical model. This will be the, the shallow water model. You've seen this before in the talks before, but not in spherical geometry. Spherical geometry is only bringing in, only bringing in the planetary vorticity variation, which is the decisive factor we need for jet formation. You can get jet formation without any shallow water dynamics. If you have a barotropic vorticity equation, you just need the planetary vorticity equation or planetary vorticity. Um, but we're going to add uh, all the extra features that come along with shallow water um, in this. Um, I'll talk briefly about the numerical model so you can see that uh, I'm trying to be honest about the calculations that we're doing here. Um, and we're trying to reach, uh, we're trying to do long term high resolution simulations, and we need a special numerical model for that kind of purpose. And the numerical model allows the formation of sharp gradients, and sharp gradients in quantities like potential vorticity are the things that are responsible, as we'll find, um, uh, the responsible for jet formation. Um, the simulations will be of topographically forced flows. Um, as far as I know, there's only been a, a few other works, uh, one notable work, uh, which specifically tried to put in, um, when I say topographically forced, I don't really mean topog topography in the way we think of it, where you have static mountains that sit there for long times over geological timescales. Here, we're going to put in uh, mountains that move. So they're going to be actually not really topography, but some kind of undulating bottom surface, which is, which is, which is perturbing the dynamics. And the picture, yep, time-dependent random forcing. That's right. Source sink, if you want to view it that way, it's going to be in the mass field or in the height field um, equation. And they're going to be basically models of sort of thunderstorms convection that we don't resolve below in below the so-called weather layer. So again, I don't want to get into the physical model too much in terms of realism, but the, there have been lots of works, as I'll come to in a moment, where people have been trying to find a model that somehow puts in forcing that we think might be happening in Jupiter, um, in particular, where we've seen um, lightning, widespread lightning in the clouds, in the Juno and other missions that have gone by. So we, we know it's stormy, um, and uh, yet there's... Um, clouds above this layer. We don't, you know, the layering of the atmosphere isn't that well known. We only have a few probes that have actually fallen through to measure vertical structure. Um, but we, one model is of some underlying region, uh, possibly magnetic, um, which is producing some kind of convective um, behavior and perturbing the, the bottom of uh, the weather layer. So you could view the layer I'm looking at as sort of the stratosphere on Earth, if you like, and some kind of much more dense um, lower layer below, which is uh, where the convection is taking place. Again, that's probably simplistic because there's probably no sharp transition between these layers, but it's a model. Okay, we'll see what this model gives you. People have tried um, crazier things, so this is not the most wild idea you can do. And in fact, lots of people have been trying to um, um, model this kind of behavior of thunderstorms, um, but using different ways, different kinds of forcing that may not be appropriate. Little discussion, just summarizing the results that were found here. This is still a work in progress. We're actually in the business of sort of finishing simulations and writing up a paper about this. But then I'll spend some time in probably the second hour about this um, jet problem. So focusing on a single jet and its dynamics. Um, what can be learned about a, a jump in potential vorticity, um, both in shallow water and in the limit of the quasitropic model that we looked at before, and then a few conclusions. Okay, that's where we're going. So with Richard in the audience here, so one of the key papers, the first paper probably uh, to do this as discussed in the abstract was the first work to actually study forced dissipative shallow water spherical turbulence. Um, so uh, before that, there was a, a person, James Cho, who was a PhD student of Lorenzo Pavani at New York in um, Columbia. Um, I, was, I was lucky enough to be his uh, PhD examiner uh, back in, when, when was it? Probably about 1990 or something. I can't remember, 1992, yeah. Um, but uh, so James Cho, I still work with. Uh, he's uh, currently in, in Brandeis University in, in Boston area. Uh, but, uh, and, but anyway, um, they worked together. So James Cho was looking at uh, um, unforced simulations of shallow water dynamics and 
find some weak jets forming in that case. So what we'll find is that, and I've done a lot of calculations in other exam examples where if you don't keep supplying forcing and maybe a little bit of damping, damping's not as critical, but if you don't keep forcing the flow, eventually you run out of steam and you can't maintain jets. The jets basically um, can form a certain steepness and then they stay there and they're not particularly strong necessarily. So you need a, well, all right, so I'll come to the viscosity thing in a minute. So I, I'm not putting in explicit viscosity here. Um, other methods have done so, but usually through hyperviscosity. Um, if you put in ordinary viscosity, molecular viscosity, then the damping is way too large to see anything. You get a smeared out picture. I think even Gareth Williams back in the day, in the 70s, was doing uh, hyperviscosity or some version of that because he was doing spherical shallow water, spherical barotropic calculations at the time. So you can't use ordinary viscosity at the modest resolutions we can now reach. And I say modest, meaning that if you can do grids by thousands by thousands, it's still relatively modest. I mean, there, there are details that are hard to capture even at these high resolutions. In particular, one conspicuous thing that everybody um, notices on Jupiter is the red spot. And it's pretty hard in these models to actually capture a sustained red spot in these calculations. I don't do it still, and I'm using one of the most advanced numerical methods for this. It's hard to capture. And it could be we're using the wrong model. Um, arguably, the model we should be using is some kind of model that permits bare clinic behavior, like, the, like a two-layer system at the very minimum. And uh, that's sort of um, work that I'm trying to get into currently, which I think needs to be done to be able to capture um, a uh, red spot or other vortices that are sustained on in these planetary atmospheres. Um, the single layer dynamics um, seems to be, it's very difficult in a single layer model to capture long lived vortices. We typically find jets, but relatively few vortices. That's not to say that we don't see them, but they don't live, they're, they're ephemeral, they don't last, last long. Anyway, so um, then, so from the same paper, um, it, there was, is this maybe later, 2007, is this the second paper? Is there two papers here? Same one, same paper, okay. So in the same paper then, they looked at simulations with parameters um, that were chosen to be uh, roughly along the lines of what people thought would be the Ju Jap atmosphere of Jupiter, the Saturn, Uranus, Neptune here. Um, and uh, the main key controlling parameter we'll see is the so-called deformation length. Um, and of course, the deformation length has to be based on a polar Coriolis frequency, not the Coriolis frequency anywhere because deformation radius in that sense would blow up at the equator. So in, ter in terms of a, um, a single parameter, there's a length scale that comes, comes about by combining a gravity wave speed and a polar value of the Coriolis frequency that gives you a length. Um, and that length is thought to be about 1 40th of the radius of the uh, planet in the case of Jupiter. I think around 1 20th, 1 25th in the case of Saturn, but I'm not sure exactly what it is in here. Maybe a bit bigger, four or five times. Um, Richard probably knows better than that, but this is asking him to remember something from 2007. Sorry, he, does, he shakes his head. Okay. Um, I didn't look at the, the exact parameters, but. Yeah, of course, there's another, of course, the, the level of forcing is another key parameter. We'll come to that. We'll, I'll discuss all the parameters. I'll unfold them all, and you'll see how bad it is in a moment. Uh, but uh, of course, the, the main thing is the deformation length and also then the forcing amplitude that you apply. Um, then other things like the type of forcing, the type of, damp type of damping, all these things are factors as well. So interesting in the, in the I left the paragraph here basically, it said that uh, you know, they're, they basically don't know what kind of forcing there is, but they would like to model the overturning convective systems and other random motions. Um, we're not specified here, but basically we don't, there was a lot of ambiguity. We still don't really know what's going on. In fact, the latest picture is that what's happening at the poles is different from what's happening at the equator. And throughout, as you vary latitude, you get different impact. You may have internal radiation effects, which are strongest maybe at the equator, whereas in the poles, it may be more of these thunderstorm forcing. So we're not quite sure. There could be mid-latitude baroclinic <coughs> instability, which is completely out with this model we're not getting. Maybe you can cook it up by some kind of other forcing. It might be possible to design a vorticity forcing that, that does some effective baric, uh, models, baroclinic instability in this single layer system um, in mid-latitudes. But 
again, doing that is complicated the problem. Okay, so you you could say, all right, I want to model, I want to I want a weather forecast for Jupiter. Well, we can't do that, um, and uh, we'd like to know what happens if you try to do the cleanest experiment you can, where you have one kind of forcing, which is isotropic across the sphere. Um, the reality is that it's probably not isotropic. It's probably located in certain equatorial or in latitudinal bands. But we to get that realistic would mean introducing many parameters and being forever in your whole career studying all the parameter space. So we're not doing that here. And no one else has ever really um, dived into that, that problem. So we're pretty far from reality, probably. Um, anyway, it's, it's the key thing is that the idea is that we're thinking that there might be convective systems that are forcing the flow here, and that's what is model or uh, motivating the current way we're going to force the flow. Um, there was a key work by Adam Schoeman, the same special issue, um, also published in 2007, um, where they specifically uh, injected um, mass by thunderstorms, so-called thunderstorms. They produced localized mass anomalies into the shallow water system, and they took it away by some radiative damping effects, which would basically relax the free surface and conserve total mass. So that was the model here. Um, I have to say, in this paper, it was not a global model. So they took a sector, a mid-latitude sector, which may have, I think, overlapped the equator, and they just did a sector model. Okay, so it, it, the radiation affects the mass. Plus, but so it's not mass. It's In shell water, it's really temperature. It's some kind of measure of, of heat. Um, so you're basically relaxing the heat back. Yeah, so it, I'm using mass the wrong way. Yeah. They use the word mass, that's why I was sort of reading it from here. Um, mass pulses, but really it's, uh, it's temperature pulses. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to follow something like this, but not in, not try to put in like realistic thunderstorms or, or I mean, who knows what those are anyway. Um, so we're going to do the forcing in a, bit, a different way. So the model, uh, we've seen it many times before, not on a sphere, but um, you have this idea of a, this is not a very good picture of a shallow, but you know you have to think of it much much thinner than that. But there's a shallow um, fluid layer above a um, bottom boundary, which itself can be undulating, so it's going to be a time-dependent wobbling bottom surface, um, perturbing the motion in this layer. The whole thing's going to be rotating about the North Pole at some rotational rate omega, which we've chosen so that the time scale is one day, uh, so a unit of time will be a day in these simulations. B will be the, um, this thickness here, B will be the height of the topography relative to the underlying spherical surface. So we're not going to have a geoid, nothing like this, so it's going to be a much simpler problem um, here. So we have a spherical planet with a small perturbation. Um, doesn't actually have to be small, but uh, um, in principle, B is a relatively small um, perturbation. Um, and then H is the actual thickness of the fluid layer above um, but extending from the top of the topography to the outer free surface. No planetary atmosphere looks like this, but uh, it's the, you know, it, if you like, you can view this as um, taking the first uh, mode of a baroclinic system and viewing it as a layer model in shallow water. So there's a whole, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into that. That's a, um, people doing compressible atmospheres realize that there's a relationship between vertical modes and layer models, and that's sort of, the idea behind these shallow water systems. H is a function of time, latitude, and longitude. Yeah, yeah. So this is fully uh, two dimensional on a sphere, um, latitude, longitude dependence. That's critical, or else we wouldn't get the. Uh, it's hard to get, the, as we found in our own paper, you're not, all you get there are some small rearrangement of potential vorticity if you don't have any mixing, potential vorticity mixing. You need the potential vorticity mixing which is due to breaking Rossby waves, so you need longitudinal dependence. So both B and H? Yes, everything, every, that's right, yep. B and H both vary with latitude and longitude and time. Hmm? Oh, capital H is constant. Capital H is the, is the mean depth. The mean depth of the fluid will not change, so I'm gonna keep that fixed. The, the forcing's coming only through here. Yes, I'm relaxing on a time scale tau. The, the source is here, exactly. The forcing is here, the damping is this term. 
So here's the temperature relaxation back to um, its basic, uh, basically back to rest. Yeah, so it's basically trying to make uniform temperature everywhere. And uh, on a time scale tau, that's going to thermodynamic rate. It turns out this parameter is not that important. As long as it's long, um, it doesn't play much of a role, tau. Yeah, so we're, we'll end up doing simulations where this is hundreds of days up to thousands of days. Results don't depend greatly on that. Maybe the amplitude of the flow varies a little bit with it, but it turns out to be a relatively weak dependence on this. So, so two omega is four, so yeah, exactly. So I'm gonna take omega to be two pi in what comes. So basically every unit time, the planet rotates once. Yep, so one, one, one time unit will be one revolution. So when you see simulations where you're seeing time 10,000, it's 10,000 days of, of, of rotation. Um, all right, so anyway, this is the usual, you know, uh, Coriolis and uh, acceleration, um, the hydrostatic pressure gradient on the right-hand side, usual mass continuity, well, maybe temperature equation now with uh, the thermal damping term. So the equations are dead simple. Okay, they look simple. Of course, they're, they're a beast to calculate these things. You have to do spherical geometry, you know, latitude, longitude, the, all the things with vectors and, and spherical geometry are nasty. So in, in vector form, they're nice. Well, it can, it's going, on, on average, the average value of B is zero. So it's gonna be going up and down in different places, but the average will be zero. So you're not actually um, changing the mean temperature. Yes, you could, you could, you could relax H back to a, an equilibrium form. People do that. Um, of course, uh, um, that's one other model of the, the damping, that's right. So this is the standard model for that was Shoman had done, for instance, where you relax back to zero temperature. Sorry. Questions are too long. <laughs> We're both guilty, okay. Um, yeah, so yes, there are, there are alternative models like this. And th All right. But what Richard's saying, what Richard's saying is that essentially the time scale for this to change is short compared to the time scale for, um, I right, said so that. Right, but the, 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 this will, you, you, when you try to relax on a long time scale to something that's moving all over the place, you relax to the mean. So that basically it doesn't change this at all. It'll be a very negligible, as long as there's, there's a big time scale separation between the thermal damping time and the decorrelation time of the forcing, um, you can do this. Yeah. That's right, so it's different. So here we're doing specifically topographic. Yeah, I agree. So the topographic forcing is, is motivated by, it's the only way that you can it can model the actual uh, moving up and down to the bottom surface. You have to do it there, okay? Or given, yeah, they're, they're given because we're not we're not assuming the flow is is viscous or anything, so we, you can have any slip velocity on the bottom surface. So we're simply saying that. Yes, yes. Yeah, you're right. And the, the, that, that's a good model for a situation where the thickness of the atmosphere is about the line width here compared to the entire depth here. So it's, it's you know, this would be, yeah. And in the ocean case, you have to be a little more careful, of course, because the mixed layer depth could be a few hundred meters compared to the few kilometers, and then even one in 10, you're gonna have significant impact of the finite thickness. Yeah. 
And that's why I think the barrier cleaning problem would be really interesting here. I think having two layers here where you can vary the thickness. In fact, you could have two layers of um, equal thickness, but just permitting baroclinic effects. I think would suddenly get the jets and you'd probably get the vortices developing at the same time. And I'd love to do that problem. It just happens to be that I couldn't, uh, maybe next week. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> okay. Um, so, what else is, uh, that's the rest of standard. So everything else is standard. So the model is simple. The only thing I want to say more is that if you take the curl of this equation, which gives you the vorticity equation, um, the curl on the right-hand side is zero, so there's no impact of the forcing on vorticity. So this is a vorticity-free forcing. And almost everything else up to now has used a vorticity forcing in the equation. Okay, so this is distinct from previous work, except for Schumann, um, of not having any vorticity forcing. Now that's important, we'll see in a moment, because Vorticity forcing is good from the point of view of not, pr not producing gravity waves. This forcing is very bad for producing gravity waves. Because you're directly pushing things up and down, and what do you think is going to happen? I mean, if you push the surface up, waves spread out on a, on a pond. Yeah. Yes, so... Right, of course, it will generate vorticity backward. Yeah, so indirectly, it's producing vorticity. And of course, you need that. You wouldn't get the spin up and the jet formation without it. But along the way, it first produces divergent motions. And the divergent motions can be significant unless the parameters are chosen so that the divergence is relatively weak. So, this is the regime where you need to have weak forcing um, over you know, long time scales that will produce relatively weak di um, divergence. So, there's like a sweet spot to get the right kind of uh, forcing here. If you put too much forcing in, which we started with originally because we had no idea how to set the forcing amplitude, you get huge gravity waves, which dominate everything. You don't see much uh, taking place. The, the gravity waves are everywhere. Um, whereas here, um, we now know how to choose the, the forcing. So here's the, the image of the um, supposed thunderstorms that are, are present. This is, of course, on Earth. Uh, we don't have a similar image on Jupiter. Um, but uh, just to get an idea of the, the kind of forcing we're thinking about. Um, the actual implementation of forcing actually follows, again, uh, Richard and uh, Lorenzo Pavani, where um, they had some kind of time-correlated random field, um, a set of spherical harmonics, um, which we either take a flat spectrum across a narrow range in, in total wave number, 30 to 34, um, or in um, the, a broadband distribution, which is shown here. Here's the spectrum in log-log scales. Um, that we're using, which has some kind of cubic dependence. So basically it rises like, like n cubed for small n. Um, these are large scales. Um, reaches a maximum around the forcing peak wave number of KB32, um, then falls off rapidly. Falls off even faster than Gaussian. So they're basically trying to produce, strong, you'll see what this looks like in a minute, but I'm not saying this is realistic, but it's um, this is the broadband forcing and the narrow band forcing is uh, where it's basically a top hat over just four wave numbers right there, four or five wave numbers. The, the, then, okay, before I show you the picture of the thermal, the, the forcing, the damping is this thermal relaxation term, which just to motivate where it happens. So the, really we're thinking about the depth anomaly being the potential temperature anomaly in shallow water theory. Um, and um, Thompson and McIntyre in particular argue strongly that this is the relevant form of damping in these outer planetary atmospheres, that the um, Ekman damping plays a negligible role. There's no lower hard surface that, that can be um, producing Ekman, Ekman damping. So we have to think about this. Now, this is a very idealized radiative cooling. Um, the real thing is, is much harder than that. But again, for the purpose of simplicity, having a single parameter, this kind of damping with a single parameter, which has been used, again, in thousands of works in the literature, is what we're going to follow here, just to keep things simple. Um, we might be all doing the same thing, you know, following the lemmings off the cl cliff, uh, but that basically it's just, you know, what everybody else does, so we're going to uh, try to keep things as similar to previous works as possible. Um, now, just a note in passing, we've seen this before, we're in the shallow water equations, not the vertically averaged equations, which is another issue altogether here. We're not doing vertically averaged green nagdi here for the sphere. Um, that has problems associated with the geoid that... I'm not kidding. It does. This is why I'm interested in this work by Andy White, et cetera, 
about how these spherical approximations, it's not so easy to formulate a green Nagy model on a sphere because of all the different things you're trying to simultaneously keep small or large um, so that you can take the proper limit. So taking the, the correct limit in spherical uh, or in a oblate spherical system um, to get the right equations for something like green Agni is actually a difficult problem. I know we're not gonna talk more about that. In, in the shallow water system, which is the simplest model here, we can combine gravity and H um, so that we get a single parameter where neither parameter then appears in the equations as long as we use the dimensionless height anomaly with this H tilde or our displacement in the lecture one um, and a dimensionless topographic anomaly, if you like, B tilde, B over H. So once we scale these things this way and we use the variables H tilde, B tilde, and this number here, we never see G or H separately, which is nice. Okay, so for the scaling, we're gonna scale all lengths by the radius of planets. So one will be our, the radius of the sphere, um, all times by the planetary rotation rate um, or period. Uh, that's not the planetary rotation period, it should be two pi over omega here, it's another mistake. So we're basically taking um, the radius of the planet to be one and its rotation to be two pi, about the North Pole. For the remaining parameters, there's four parameters here in this simplest of all systems. The key one that is a physical parameter here that you have to always have, and you can take this um, KD to zero, which will be the barotropic model, is the Rosby deformation wave number. Call it the deformation wave number. Hmm? This is, no, this is the Rosby deformation wave number. It has wave number, wave number. Length is C over two omega. You're right, yeah. yeah. So it turns out that KD is actually, if you think about the operator that's involved in, at least in the, in the uh, shallow water system on a plane, you see that um, KD is more um, a, a, like a wave number because it appears as a wave number in the equations. Um, people call it the inverse of that, the length. There's a factor of maybe two pi or pi, depending on whether you like two pi or pi, which changes that. So when people talk about a certain Rossby deformation length, their length is off by maybe a factor of pi or two pi in interpretation, because it's really relevant. The wave number is relevant here. So KD will be our key controlling parameter. We're thinking about KD being large in most of these applications. Thermal relaxation time scale, we want this to be long compared to a day. It's not a particularly important parameter, but we'll see how it affects things. Amplitude of forcing is a very important parameter. Um, uh, B, I'm gonna call it BRMS, so we'll talk about how we set that in a minute. So we're setting the root mean square um, displacement at any given moment. And then there's finally a final parameter, the forcing decorrelation time scale, the time scale for the forcing to look quite different or almost different, totally different after the time TB. Um, you'll see that in a moment, yeah. So spatial distribution is being controlled by either making it broad band or narrow band, but keeping it um, with this form. So the, the spatial distribution is going to be always controlled by this spectrum. So either this one, this, no, so this is N. So this is like the sphere, total spherical harmonic wave number. So this basically, it, it, it's, these are all, there's many spherical harmonics. So there's two N minus one spherical harmonics for every N that you're actually included in a shell, okay? So it's, a, it's the wave number shell. All right, so well, that's the forcing, but okay. So then I'm not gonna go through the details, but basically you basically take, um, for every time step you take, you guess a random field, you just generate a set of a random field over um, the sphere with the right spectrum. Then you redefine the new value of the forcing by a multiple of its previous value and the current one, and then you scale things appropriately so that the new value here is still has the right RMS value. So it's a simple way of, of updating the forcing, which slowly then evolves in time. This is what the forcing looks like. Um, there's two types. In the top, we're showing narrow band. We're actually evolving this in time. The decorrelation time is 40 units of time here. We're showing time 0, 72, 144, so it's more than a de decorrelation time. The pattern here looks different to that, looks different to that. So it's basically, the, the pattern keeps shifting in a way that uh, it should. And we've tested to make sure that if it's, if it's 400, that nothing changes much in these um, patterns. Noticeably, there's not a great difference between 
narrow band on the top and broad band on the bottom. I mean, maybe if you're really discerning and you know your spectra well, you can see that the things are more elongated and less structured here. Here, they're much more circular and, and localized here. So the narrow band localizes things to make a much more checkerboard uh, appearance, whereas uh, broadband tends to be more elongated and a little bit more complex. But there's not a great deal of difference between the two. This is a view from the equator. In fact, all, almost all the images I'll show is for, are from the equator. I should have probably included a few from the pole, but the pole just shows you know, circular patterns you'll see um, in some of the jets later on. I probably should have put them in just for fun, uh, but uh, we're mainly going to look at equatorial views. Um, I don't know why the, okay, I think the reason is that I have not been showing things on a slideshow. I've been gradually moving out. No one's noticed this before, but okay. Anyway, so um, we're using so-called combined Lagrangian evection method, um, where we're using potential vorticity as a um, one of the variables and using contour dynamics or contour advection for that. Um, and we're, the, this method, I, I was going to have a fourth talk on numerical methods, which with it, this would have been in a given more detail. I'm not gonna be able to do that. I can probably leave the talk for posterity if anybody wants to have it. Uh, but uh, um, this method is described there. Essentially, it uses both the contour and grid representation uh, described in this paper in JCP in 2010. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details of it, just to give you some ideas of some of the settings. We use a regular latitude longitude grid. So despite the fact that we use spherical harmonics for the forcing, which would then suggest that you wanna use a Gaussian grid for um, latitude, which is nearly, isot nearly isotropic in the case of high resolution, we're nevertheless fixing, uh, having a fixed latitude um, grid with equal spacing. This turns out to be very convenient numerically as we found in um, actually a series of works, this is the first one, um, I think in monthly weather review in 2007, where we basically took a grid uh, with the, the rings are showing lines of constant latitude, we avoid the pole. The pole is one half a latitude thickness away from, so basically the distance across from one edge to the edge of that circle is a latitude spacing. So we basically miss out the pole. Um, and this was known um, to be a good thing to do because if you include the pole, you have all kinds of polar singularities in the equations. There are no singularities in the sphere. In the sphere. It's just they're coordinate singularities and you need to avoid them correctly numerically. Um, so this kind of technique is nice because in, of course, along, you know, in longitude along these latitude circles, you can use the usual uh, FFT. So fast Fourier transforms in longitude are really convenient. Um, how about here? If you go around a great circle, it's still a circle. And they're now equally spaced points, you can use FFTs there too. So what's nice about this method is that you can use these fast forward transforms in both directions. And of course, there's only, you only use half the number of longitudes to do that, but it's convenient numerically. And you get high accuracy, spatial accuracy because of that. All right, so then alongside potential work, see we saw this in the last lecture, we're going to use, like in the previous work uh, I was illustrating last lecture, we're gonna use the divergence um, and the so-called acceleration divergence. I was calling that previously the agiostrophic vorticity or F times the agiostrophic vorticity. It's no longer that here, unless you redefine what you mean by agiostrophic vorticity. But the variable that I introduced in the previous talk is actually the divergence of the acceleration. So if you think about the form of the acceleration, go back here to that equation. If, I, if this is my acceleration here and I move this term to the right-hand side, I take the divergence of all those equations, those terms, I get what I call my, my gamma variable, okay? And uh, that's true both in the F-plane and in the spherical geometry. And that turns out to be the convenient variable to use here. Okay, and then, uh, so we're gonna use that in place of H and U. That of course then means that we have to do some kind of generalized inversion. I'm not gonna give the details. It's similar to what I described in the last talk. It's in spherical geometry, but nothing really is significantly different when you have to do the whole thing in spherical geometry. Um, their whole purpose of doing this, which I've emphasized last time, is it improves the accuracy of both the balanced PV controlling dynamics and the imbalance or gravity waves. And there's like, I don't know, about seven papers in this range where we over and over kept using this method trying to show um, the impact of using different discretizations and different ways of representing flow variables to see the impact on the numerical results. Um, 
And regarding the initialization, we start with potential vortex distribution equal to the planetary distribution. So if we had no topography, this would be a flow at rest, but we do have topography. And initially there's some initial top topography there and it's just gonna slowly vary in time. So we have to get the initial state by um, requiring the balance relations that result from setting the first time derivatives of these terms equal to zero. So these are nonlinear equations which you solve in spherical geometry. It's not nice, but you know they can be done. It, it's robustly convergent. You get, they're like elliptic problems that are nonlinear, but you can solve them. And they define the initial delta and gamma fields. And later on in time, if you wanted to deduce the, the balance part of the dynamics, which I'm not going to do here, um, you can use these same relations um, to take the potential vorticity at any fixed time instead of zero and use these relations to work out the balance part of the flow. And that's interesting, but it's not so interesting here where uh, the topographic forcing is uh, producing so much imbalance. Um, anyway, the corresponding then fields of H and U are found by inverting, as I mentioned before, these definitions, and I'm not, not giving details. All right, for the results then, we've investigated the following groups of parameters. In each case, each parameter varies by a factor of five from one, five to 25. Uh, thermal damping says so deformation length or deformation radius or weight number. Thermal damping time scales, 100 days, 500 days, 2,500 days. Root mean square topography. These look like very small values. Initially, we were start, starting much bigger values and you know, within a few you know, tens of days, suddenly we just started getting like rubbish. I mean, it's like gravity wave breaking, clearly shocks are forming. It doesn't take much forcing to get very strong gravity wave um, dynamics. So that's already a strong forcing, which is only 1 40th and you know, everything's order one in this model. So that seems like a small number, but we've gone down to 10 minus three uh, to get the weakest forcing. And that's what I'll start with in showing results there. And we've taken decorrelation time scales of 10, 50 and 250. And here the results are almost insensitive, completely insensitive to that, damp that decorrelation time. Exactly, yeah, so the, so B tilde, what this should really be tilde RMS, you're right. So it's the fractional um, displacement, RMS displacement of the bottom topography relative to the thickness, mean thickness of the fluid. That's right. And if I, if I don't say that, what I mean, and whenever I look at height or topography, I always mean it relative to the mean depth, right? So it'd be fractional terms. So this, this forcing of 10 to the minus three of the mean depth, it seems awfully small. You know, very, very weak. Um, well, um, I think if you send TB to infinity, I think probably nothing much happens because what, what, what our results are showing is that from 10 to 250, there's almost no difference. So you can have stationary forcing or time dependent forcing. The decorrelation of the forcing doesn't seem to play much of a role here. So it's the weakest premise. So the weakest parameter variations occurring here the second on this one, although here it changes the amplitude of the final flow, um, here there's a drastic dependence on BRMS. And here is a, again a weak dependence, surprisingly. So I think Richard's gonna be most interested in this because he hasn't seen some of the latest results on this, but um, varying KD doesn't seem to make much difference in terms of uh, the final results you get. Um, now, KD 10 to 40, maybe even less than 10, thought, thought to be appropriate for the gas giants. Uh, but again, I'm not going to try to say that this is a model of the gas giants, but it's a basic GFD problem. Um, we're using a basic grid resolution of a ridiculously low value, 256 by 512, but the effective resolution can be roughly 16 times finer in each direction. This is a very well resolved um, simulation. Um, and the simulations are run for between 10 to the 4 and 10 to 5 days, and they are run using a time step which resolves the fastest gravity wave in the planet. Um, so this is hard. So we're trying to say, okay, we're going to say the gravities were there, are there. We're not going to try to filter them by some sort of um, semi-implicit time stepping that, you know, uses a big time step and destroys the gravity waves. Uh, we're going to resolve the gravity waves because we, they may be part of the problem. In fact, we know Kelvin waves are almost certainly part of the equatorial dynamics, and we want to resolve those, although they're probably not so sensitive to the time step choice. All right. First simulation set. So the first results then 
Um, we're going to just vary one thing at a time. Um, and here I'm going to simply, simply contrast narrow band and broad band forcing. And I'm going to take the very weakest forcing that we took, 10 to the minus 3, um, uh, the, well, not the weakest, but weak thermal damping, 500. Um, a, the smallest deformation radius or length that we've taken, or, or actually the smallest deformation length of the highest deformation wave number of 25, and a moderate, de this, this doesn't really matter here, uh, the de decorrelation time. But the main thing is to look at what the effect narrow band and broad band forcing are. And here's the vorticity field at three different times. This is time 20,000 days. It takes that long to get almost, you know, starting to see some banding. Um, after 40,000 days, you have this, some structures happening at the poles, maybe something at the equator. And after 60,000 days, a long time scale, okay? It takes 60,000 days to spin up this flow. Um, and it, we're not saying it's equilib equilibrated. It's not clear it's equilibrated. Um, and it could be that over longer time scales, th other things will happen. I'll show some other results that indicate there's some level of equilibration, but it's not guaranteed that we've gone far enough. Practically nothing apart from, well, we do get this, in the, in the narrow banded case, we do get an equatorial, so this is relative vorticity. So positive means it's spinning this way, okay, right hand this way. Uh, it means that you're getting a um, westward jet. So the flow is moving this way at the equator. Retrograde. Yeah, very, very, very weak signature there. It's built up there. So this tends to be a, an issue that people have noticed for a long time in these shallow water simulations that equatorial jets build up. And it might be due to, to Kelvin wave, might be due to the damping mechanism. I think Richard knows more about this than I do in terms of the different kinds of damping mechanisms like getting away from thermal damping or changing the way thermal damping acts at the equator um, can control what's happening at the equator. The, I wouldn't put much trust in what happens at the equator in these models. Or thermal damping time. Well, in terms of a mid-latitude Rossby wave um, time scale, it's comparable because of just the definition of beta. Um, at mid-latitudes, it would be maybe a factor of root two different. So it's still many Rossby wave for the for the gravest mode. If you're looking at for beta for a relative for the wave number KD, then you, if that's what you mean then it's going to be a factor of KD times, so roughly, that's probably around 1,000, 1,000 of those time scales, 1 to 2,000. That might be the right time scale. We don't know really what the, what the controlling time scale is, but we do know that um, it, do, it does depend on this value here, that if you make this value smaller, the time scale extends. And we think it's on the square root of BRMS, but that's not completely certain. Um, there's also an impact on KD. Um, surprisingly, tau is not making much of a role. Tau is still short compared to these time scales. So this is already, uh, this is like 300 damping time scales, a long time. Whereas what Richard and I were doing years ago in the, bare, in the planar case, we didn't have to go more than 10 damping time scales and we got results, yeah? Energy's doing, well, yeah, I didn't show energy plots. Um, energy by now is more or less equilibrated. Okay, um, angular momentum is another issue which I didn't want to talk about. Angular momentum is going all over the place. Okay, so angular momentum can't be, can't be conserved easily in these models unless you um, maybe adjust the rotation rate. It's not conserved. No, I mean, there's nothing, you can actually write an equation for the angular momentum evolution. You can see the topography is going to change it. It varies. So it, it, typically angular momentum goes down. So basically, the flow is decelerating. The whole, the whole solid body rotation is, short, is slowing down due to this forcing. It's, it's very, very slight, but it's not conserved, and it's, it's slowing down the rotation. But the main point here is that with this weak forcing, you don't get much. You get a few polar um, jets. These are the, so the blue-red patterns correspond to, notice it's red-blue here, but here's blue-red, blue-red. These correspond to, um, um, prograde eastward jets that are appearing here. So this is what we expect to happen um, due to um, Rossby wave breaking or so-called inhomogeneous mixing. 
makes things very, been very efficient in this region and between those jets, um, but then it's leaving these sharp jumps in potential vorticity, which I'm not showing here, but trust me, potential vorticity, we'll see that in a minute. There are strong gradients of potential vorticity appearing here and here that are responsible for these jets. Okay. Um, interestingly, in the broadband case, which you might think is the more realistic case, it seems to be more washed out. Nothing as dramatic happens. I don't, we don't really understand that, but um, there's a difference in the forcing, um, even seen early on even. Um, you can look at the amplitudes here too, that here the vorticity is up to 0.6. Oh, sorry, too much talking. Um, so you see the amplitude's up to 0.6 here, um, and it's only 0.3 here. So there's twice as much um, amplitude, although the probably more extreme values and more separated here, just um, more uniform. No, it's just different. It's it's a different uh, spectrum of the forcing, that's all. The forcing amplitude is the same. Um, the only difference in the forcing is the pattern looks slightly different. Remember the image I showed of the... It's, it, here's the, here, the only difference is that in the top row, I'm using this forcing, bottom row is using that forcing. That's all, that's surprising. You know, there, it doesn't look like there should be that much difference, but that level of difference in forcing, which indicates there's a zoo out there in terms of the dependence on forcing. What do we put in for forcing? And if you change the forcing, you may get dramatically different results. Definitely not predictable results. RMS, exactly the same. Yes. Their narrow band, you're right. Because of that, the narrow band maximum will be higher. So it's probably the more extreme values that are, that are actually leading to this. So that's leading to the sharpening. That's probably a good point, yes. That's the higher or higher maximum values that are responsible for the breaking that we're seeing here that lead to the jets. Okay, and then, well, just to show you what the divergence looks like, well, the divergence looks like the forcing. So the forcing basically is generating this convergence divergence with a pattern that's very much similar to the underlying forcing and... Oh yeah, I mean, that's right. It's, it stays like this with similar amplitudes all throughout the entire evolution of around 0.12 to 0.16. It's almost instantly. Uh, because initially it's balanced in with, with respect to the underlying topography and initially it looks like this too. So it's basically equilibrated from the beginning and it doesn't change. And But there, there's no evidence that there's any kind of shocks or formation of small scales here. Um, so it's all basically scales of the forcing you're seeing. Um, this is what the height anomaly looks like. So this is a height anomaly relative, so this is the displacement of the free surface relative to the thickness of the free surface. Displacements are on the order of 2% here, growing to 4%, maybe, I can't read that very well, but 3% again, so a few percent. You can see the banding forming in the depth field at the, um, in the polar regions, and you see that it dips in the equator. So you have a lower uh, free surface in the equatorial regions. Band Well, DHD5 is vanishing. Well, at the equator, um, that's under geostropic balance, it does, but here we're not, the, this is not a balanced flow, so it doesn't have to. So if you're doing balance, geostropic balance, it would. It's fine. It's fine, it is fine. So the, the, the but DHDY does not have to vanish at the equator, or DHD latitude, right? It doesn't. But you can see it's actually, it's relatively flat there. Even though the Coriolis vanishes there, there's still, high order effects that are going on that are leading. Yeah, does not have to vanish. But it is flattening. You get this region of uh, fairly uniform height right at the equator and it's uh, negative. Okay, this is the interesting problem uh, pat pattern. So here, if you look at the zonal average, zonal velocity, now as a function of time, which is right along here, and latitude here, latitude between minus pi over two, pi over two, south pole, north pole, um, you're seeing as, as the flow evolves in time, um, these red regions correspond to increasing or um, prograde eastward jets developing. So you can see the jets that we saw in the, just focusing on the, the uh, this narrow band, this broad band. You even see it here, but the amplitudes are half of what they are here. So they're twice as strong the flows here. 
So you have a, a prograde jet there, a, you can call it a retrograde jet there, or sometimes um, you can call that a return flow, just the region between the jets that have to, by continuity, go backwards. So you have jet, jet. The equ equatorial region is, has a growing retrograde jet, this uh, backward westward jet, which seems to co be a common feature. It's not universal, but in many cases, it's the most common feature developing, and we find this not always, but in many of our simulations, we get this growing um, eastward jet. Here, for broadband, it's stronger at one time and then maybe weakens a little bit towards the end. But um, in these, you can see that the jets form and they become, they, they look steady in the sense that um, they're straight across. There's the, they, they, form, they form in certain latitude regions and stay there, okay? Now, the important thing is that, talking about PV inversion, here's the, la the long latitudinal gradient of potential vorticity, the mean potential vorticity. So I first zone the average potential vorticity, then I take its latitudinal derivative. Um, and so initially, it's basically what you're seeing here is, is F um, here, the latitude derivative of F. Um, and in time, this breaks down to form these black, dark black regions. The, the black regions here correspond to high gradients of potential vorticity. And the, if you look carefully, the high gradients correlate exactly with the eastward jets there, there, and these two, there, even the splitting that takes place, there may be some other example, I can't remember, maybe the next one. Second yeah, so this is the first, the second derivative of U bar, if you want. It's not quite so simple in spherical geometry, but, but yeah. It's not the first derivative. No, it's not. But the, the, the derivative of the, the gradient is the important thing, because for a PV staircase with a single jump with a sharp gradient, these things would go to infinity. Um, and we know from what I'll talk about in the next hour, and I should stop very soon now, um, that the sharp gradient is co-located with a eastward jet, okay? And in between these, in weak gradient regions, so where it's white, the gradients are wiped out. This is the, the inhomogeneous mixing, lots of mixing between, no mixing at the sharp gradients. Um, and that's where you get the backward, westward flows in the mixed regions. Even the equatorial region, if you have really good eyes, you might see there's like a lighter smudge here that corresponds to weakened gradients at the equator. And the weak ingredients are responsible for the retrograde jet forming at the equator. And the same thing can be seen here. You really have to have good eyes there. Mine aren't good enough, but I think there's a, a lighter color there corresponding to this, this thing here. But again, you can see the jets forming. In fact, here's this merging taking place. You can see it directly in this red and this red merging in. So the main thing to take away from this is that potential vorticity, um, the potential vorticity, mean potential vorticity is telling you a lot about the jet formation here. It's from the inhomogeneous mixing, the breaking Ross waves that are causing these jets to form. Okay, I will stop here because there'll be a second simulation set and then I'll conclude this part and talk about the next um, thing about the single jet later in the next hour. Okay, so second simulation, there's only three simulation sets, so don't get worried that there's gonna be like N going to infinity here. Um, and the this is the most interesting of the simulation sets. The next one is not interesting so it might be skipped, but we'll see what happens. Um, so here, the only difference um, is that I've changed the forcing by a factor of five. So everything else is exactly the same, um, and uh, just the forcing's changed. Um, and again, we're looking at narrow band and broad band forcing, and again, we'll show vorticity first. There it is. Suddenly very different, okay? So with the greater forcing, just the forcing's gone up by a factor of, the time is now, Yes, it's now 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 instead of 20, 40, 60. That's because we know that with higher forcing, you get the jets forming much more rapidly. So that's what I'm saying. There's a dependence on BRMS, which seems to scale with the square root of it. So we don't need to go nearly as far in time to get the same development. And now the jets are everywhere. So we have bands of, um, of uh, well, jets everywhere in the sense that uh, you have these um, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, then a opaque region, red to blue. This is again showing the development of a, a westward jet, uh, retrograde jet at the equator in both types of forcing. Again, this is narrow band on top, broad band. Now the distinction is not that great. Um, what else can I show? So you get these, so if you look here, there at early times there are maybe one, two, three jets up here, maybe a fourth. Um, and then later, these jets are in different places. And then later, again, they're in a different place. 
Um, the amplitude, well, we'll see the amplitude measured in terms of the zonal mean zone velocity in a minute. That's a better way of measuring amplitude. Um, surely the gradients have increased. There seemed some kind of merging that probably took place between some of these jets. You have to really look at movies at this to see this, but probably there's been coalescence. You'll see that in the Hofmuller diagram in a moment where um, some jets merge together to get stronger ones. Um, so there's clearly a strong mid-latitude jet there. Um, I keep saying they're wavy. I should keep reminding you that I often find wavy jets, and this is not um, something that people make a big deal of, but you can see everywhere the jets are wavy. And in fact, Richard and I have found in the um, uh, QG limit on a beta plane, when we did simulations there, in fact, it was, wasn't the, we did LD infinity. So we actually did the bare tropic. Yeah, it was L, that double periodic belt um, with just beta. Um, we also found lots of wavy jets. So it's a, the wavy jets seem to be a generic feature. And, and there we're using very different forcing. There we were using a vorticity forcing, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, so. Yes. It is, yes. So they're, both are now producing um, some, again, probably the, the intensity of the forcing is higher, the actual maximum minimum values here. Um, and if you look at the amplitudes, though, they're hardly different. I mean, maybe the same. They're roughly the same in this case. So it's not so sensitive to the um, nature of the um, spectrum anymore. It depends more on the forcing level in this case. Um, there's nothing else, else to point out, except uh, now if you look at the divergence, divergence slightly more structure to it than before. It's still picking up a lot of the underlying forcing, but you see there's like light regions here and here. So there's weaker large scale patches of divergence happening. So there's now a mixture between some underlying um, divergence not associated with the forcing and the forcing is still masking it. What I should do is find some way of removing the contribution of the, of the uh, um, topography to the divergence, if there's some way of doing that. I that's something that just came to me right now, but I have to think about whether that's even possible. Uh, it's not, these balancing things are not that easy sometimes, but it would be nice actually to look at the part of the divergence that's being produced outside the topography, if that's doable. Um, but in both cases, you get uh, divergence levels that are around 0.6 to 0.8, and the vorticity values we're seeing in the previous image were about 1.6. So divergence is getting to be comparable to vorticity here. That usually indicates a dangerous flow in the sense that there's a lot of gravity waves around in this case. But the, the gravity waves are there because of the forcing that we're applying. So there, it's, and they're at higher, le higher levels here. But still, the vortical flow is dominating over the gravity wave part in this simulation, but only marginally. Um, now, this is the depth field. Again, the dimensionless or displacement field. Again, to see three, three times. The banding is maybe more evident now, but there's still a lot of the uh, visibility of the underlying. Again, here, taking out the uh, underlying topography would be helpful. Hmm? That's right, yeah. So here, the displacements are going up to about 0 0.06, 0 0.08, maybe. Um, and the forcing RMS, well, RMS is this, the actual maximum values are probably about 0 0.01, 0 0.02. So here they're three or four times bigger. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the, it's organizing also the bands, which B is not. B is always isotropic, and these are banding because of the uh, formation of the balance flow, underlying balance flow that's developing with the jets. Um, again, you see the equatorial region has a always a negative region developing. So it's always a dip at the equator. All right, Hall-Muller diagram. Now, what's the most obvious things changed? Anyone? It slopes, yes. It's drifting. All these, all the jets are drifting. Sometimes they're merging together and they're drifting north. The ones that are in mid-latitudes go to the poles and they evaporate. And then new ones seem to come out, come and take their place and, and continue rising. And, if you look again at the potential vorticity gradient, you can see the red, these red stripes are correlated with the high regions of potential vorticity gradient. So it's exactly the balance flow that's doing this. Um, 
The equatorial region, again, is a um, slightly weakened, so especially here, it's visible. Um, weakened gradients correspond to the strengthening retrograde westward flow at the equator here. Uh, but similar um, things are seen in both types of forcing uh, with similar amplitudes now. Before, it was a factor two difference in the amplitude of this flow. Now it's the comparable 0.08. Um, to put things in proper units, that would be 0.08 of the rotation rate of, um, of the planet times its radius. So if you think about the Earth, we're talking about... Yeah, for the, so these are, these are like 60 or 80 meters per second velocities probably on the Earth at the equator. Uh, so these are probably the strongest flows. I'm just, I'm not sure my calculation is done accurately, but roughly. Well, here, here, th this is westward, but all the red regions are eastward. The eastward jets always, eastward jets always correspond to sharp gradients of potential vorticity, as we'll find out in all cases, in all simulations. Not always. In many simulations they do, but there are some simulations with this kind of setup where we've gotten um, westward jets, but we need to dig deeper in the data to find out where that parameter regime lies. There have been more extensive studies by a Japanese group, and I can't remember the name of the Iwayama, or I'm not sure, is it what? But they, they actually did like an ensemble simulations um, to see what proportion would be westward or eastward equatorial jets. And you know, depending on random number generators, you can get like 80% going west or 20% going east. So it's somehow random a bit. So sometimes you, you don't, you're not guaranteed that you develop in either east or westward jet at the equator. But the prevailing situation seems to be that you get a westward jet or retrograde jet, as it's called, in these simulations. All right. So um, so this is what this came out of the Scott and Pavani paper. I think this is from their paper, um, showing the same kind of Hovland diagram here, latitude and degrees now versus time and days, um, going up to around 10 to 5 days here. And you see now the bright patterns correspond to, I think this is zonal velocity. Yeah, zonal velocity versus latitude. So you had high zonal velocity forming these bright regions. Um, these are all prograde too. It's retrograde. It's prograde here. So it's initially retrograde, switching to prograde in this case. Um, but the jets are, well, they were argued that they don't drift, but I would argue that if you look at this picture, then there's a slight drift. North, <laughs> as I pointed Richard out later, <laughs> but um, the but the jets are uh, from very early times. You form these uh, jets that persist for. It, they're not they're not nearly as bendy as these. Okay, but this is happening at um, higher values of um, BRMS, and I haven't changed any other parameters, so you have no idea whether other parameters are having some influence here. And this is another example here. I think this is different types of diff This is the situation here with the radiative re relaxation. Here they have hypodiffusion. Yeah. So depending on the diffusion, so here now they get the uh, retrograde jet at the equator, like we do. Hypodiffusion means using a operator which is less than del squared at the equator, rather than like del fourth, del sixth. So it's, uh, uh, in fact, I think it's large scale damping, yeah, large scale dissipation. No, it's it's actually probably, um, it's not, it'd be like, is it on stream function or del minus two stream function? I think it's, it's, so it's really broad, large scale. So it's like in the vorticity equation, you have your usual vorticity equation, the right hand side, if you were doing regular viscosity, it'd be del squared. If you're using like uh, um, Ekman, it'd be just a constant times the vorticity. And in this case, I think it's inverse Laplacian on vorticity for hyperdiffusion. Yeah, it's like string function. Relaxation of string function in the vorticity equation. Yeah. And that, depending on the type of, of damping you get, you get different kinds of jets and formation. And then um, I think. You've investigated that further, but uh, if there's time afterwards, if there was a discussion, we can explain that the damping seems to have a big influence, especially at the equator. Yeah. All right, so, so Shoman 
um, was about the only paper that did topographic forcing with these thunderstorms put in, but then they didn't do a full sphere, so it's pretty hard to compare these, these pictures. They only did a small sector in a small latitude range. Um, so I say, I quote them again here, is that they're you know, reminding you that they're trying to do this kind of forcing um, by thinking about overturning convective systems. Of course, other random motions might be something like vorticity forcing. I always like this cartoon. It's my favorite cartoon of the New Yorker or the magazine, uh, where, where it's like, you know, we all do the same thing. We, you know, if, if someone starts doing thermal damping using a certain model, everybody does it. So they're all running over the cliff, but the caption's wonderful. And I put down the, a ladder to walk down and said, you're overthinking this. <laughs> what? Tape measure, that's uh, right. Oh, I guess, yeah, oh, working out the length of it. Okay, how far do I have to go down? Yeah, that's good. Anyway, third simulation, yeah. Um, yes, so recently we've been, uh, I was hoping, to, I don't know why they include them in, I've been starting to make lots of them, but I didn't put them in this talk, um, probably because this talk was originally created a while ago. Um, but we have polar plots, uh, and the polar plots show more like we're seeing in Juno, where they, they're broken up and they're vortices, so there are vortices that are near the polar regions. So, They break up and maybe make arrays, or they're feeding into the arrays that are forming there. Could be something that's happening. But you know, we, we've only had like two, two dates where we can observe Jupiter, and both dates, the jets are in the same places, more or less. So there doesn't seem to be jet drift in the, the main jet system in Jupiter. Anyway, third simulation set, just to show you what happens when you change the thermal damping rate. And now, the difference also I'm gonna do, just to make it hard to understand, no, not quite, but I'm gonna take the deformation length um, to be much larger than before. So the deformation wave number um, um, will be now five, so one fifth the planetary radius. So this is quite different. Um, and uh, maybe this is like Uranus, uh, Neptune in terms of, um, I think even there it might be two or three, but I'm not sure exactly the value. But so this is a, this is much more Earth-like, if you like, where KD might be one, one or two for the Earth, or three, depending on your, your choice. But um, yeah, so the, the KD is, the radius of the Earth is one. Yeah, so this is like the, so KD equals five means that essentially you're um, allowing uh, five modes, if you like, in the latitudinal direction, view it that way. in one unit length, yes. Well, I mean, again, there's this factor of two pi. I think, it, I think it's being confused, but um, so KD is simply the value of um, the two omega divided by C, and it gives you an inverse length scale in the problem. And my length, my characteristic length is one. So you view this as a length of one fifth. If you want to view it as a Rossby deformation length, which I would argue is maybe not appropriate, the sphere, of course, has lots of factors of pi going on it. So really what I'm saying is that five corresponds to the, to the way, number of waves you can fit around a great latitude circle. No? I'm just, I'm trying to give... I know, but I'm using a radius of one for my planet, so I've already fixed that. I fixed the rotation rate of the planet, okay? I'm, I'm saying that we, you think of these things in non-dimensional terms. My, my radius of the planet is one. If I have a sphere of radius one, its circumference is two pi, right? And I'm saying the characteristic length associated with this is two pi divided by five. So you can think of that as a characteristic deformation length. I wouldn't put too much into that because we know that the deformation length doesn't really apply near the equator. It's more of a polar region um, view, but uh, I wouldn't put too much, but it's, it's a different regime. We're, if, you wanna, if you wanna view it this way, um, we're now talking about a situation where the gravity wave speed is a lot faster than before. It's five times faster, if that's more comfortable. 
Okay? And the, the paratropic case that people studied originally corresponds to um, KD going to zero or the speed going to infinity. Okay? So free surface gravity waves go infinitely fast. Everything else is the same. I've just made this five times smaller, deformation rank length five times larger, and I'm now just contrasting the same damping rate we did before, but and then a, a shorter one. And this is what you get. Okay, so notably, the number of jets you see there is comparable to what we saw before. So the 25 and five, there's a factor of five in the deformation length, and there's not a five factor of five difference in number of jets. Okay, maybe one point something, it's, it's, it's very comparable. So the number of jets you get are not sensitive to the KD value you're choosing here. And this is still true, even for KD equals one. No, it's not because of the waviness. There's waviness, of course. It may be affecting the waviness. Oh, the waviness may be affected by this, yes. So here, I don't know, I would say there's a lot of waves there. In fact, what Richard and I did in the GFM paper, in the barotropic case, um, we found lots of waves. And you know, there, the, um, you're in the barotropic region. It did, it, I mean, I guess it's the other limit where you have small deformation length, then you'd expect big waves. And that's something I'll be talking about next week in the conference, where eventually when the deformation radius gets so small, some work that Richard and I and Helen Burgess and who's now is in Manchester, we showed that basically the jets themselves start to disintegrate and forming loops, you know, like closed loops, like ocean eddies. And so there's a, you start breaking down distinction between jets and vortices at that point. So very small LD is very different regime. I'm not talking about those regimes here. Yeah. That's right. So here, the equatorial jets. Well, well, we'll see what it is in a minute. So I have the Hofmuller diagram again. That's the way to see it. Um, here, yes, the equatorial region looks like it's been weakened. Um, so at the larger deformation lengths or faster gravity speeds, equatorial dynamics are not playing as big a role as before. Absolutely the same. Same amplitude. Time scale, all these things are all the same. That's changed. Oh yes, it it's quicker. A factor two shorter again. The other control factor is this, of course. And I say, of course, because in the barotropic case, we know that um, in, 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 the, in the case where KD gets large, um, there's a screening that takes place. And that basically slows down the dynamics. We know that. It turns out to be very subtly limited or related to this KD. It's not something you can simply scales like inverse KD or KD. It's some sort of log correction, et cetera. It's never something I've ever been able, I've never been able to disentangle that. But yeah. That, Small KD values, um, the time the time scales are shorter, so you don't have to go as far. You're right. So the factor two shorter again. You get the jet formation again. If I again look at the divergence field, same as before, I would say it's, it's significantly different. But if you look carefully, look at the amplitudes now. They're now three. Before we we're seeing values of 0.06 or something. They've jumped considerably, and they're actually bigger than the vorticity. Interesting. Okay, so now the divergence is big, but now as we're flattening the free surface, it's they're playing probably less of an playing less of a role in terms of interacting with the balanced flow. So there's two things going on. Divergence is getting bigger, but it's also not really doing much at this point. Um, this is the height field. Height field is now it's starting to like look disordered again. So again, we're flattening the free surface. Um, um, in fact, if you look at the values here, they're going down now. 0.04, we had 0.08 before in the previous run. So we're starting to flatten the free surface, which makes sense. And none of the banding, none of the obvious banding we saw before. Hobmuller diagrams. Now, yes, there's some drifting taking place in some of these experiments, but there's far more formation of steady jets that persist, especially at low to mid latitudes in this example. So for what's only, the only thing that's really changed here is that, of course, there's two different damping, times scales 500, 100 doesn't really make a difference in terms of the overall structure. Um, maybe a little more drifting at 100 than 500, but um, basically you get much more steady jets at late times in this case. So uh, one of the results then is that at small KD, large deformation lengths, you get 
more zonal jets. This is not, of course, typical maybe of Jupiter, but this is what um, we're finding. All right, summary then. Um, so topographic gravity forcing, um, question any forcing induces Rossby wave breaking. I think um, Richard and I would argue that this is true, that pretty much anything you do to the background uh, uh, state of F, um, it, when you tweak it, it's going to lead to Ros Ros wave breaking and start forming jets. It leads to Ros wave rate breaking and inhomogeneous PV mixing, um, and this is discussed in some length. Um, Richard has an article in the same thing, I should state, uh, but uh, on, in spherical geometry, this was done in a planar geometry, trying to understand what's happening here. Uh, but McIntyre, back in 81, probably was the first person to actually coin the, the word inhomogeneous PV mixing, trying to think about the stratospheric polar night jet, trying to understand why there's always a jet formation during the winter um, in the stratosphere due to Rossby wave breaking. Um, so this mixing leads to steep PV gradients in places, co-located with the eastward jets. That's what we're showing with sharp PV gradients lead to eastward jets, and it's a consequence of PV inversion and the underlying balance. Um, okay, observations show that jets and gas plants seem to be locked in. That's what the Jupiter Juno uh, missions and uh, earlier missions showed. They don't seem to drift, and the exception may be in the polar regions. Um, in general, topographic, I mean, now we know that the polar regions are definitely not jet like. Um, we see vortices in all the planets now, gas giants. Um, and in general, topographic forcing causes jet drifting, um, but this depends on. Um, the level of forcing and also on the deformation length. So there are cases or regimes where you get weak drift, jet drifting or relatively no drifting. So we are trying to carve out the regime where um, topographic forcing leads to more or less steady jets. Um, so topographic forcing directly induces divergent motions, which is different from many previous st studies apart from Chauvin. Um, and this is um, producing imbalanced gravity waves. And they, they, we believe, are responsible for the jet trip in these experiments. Okay, I have just a few slides which I'd like to show, which we, which will be a very different character um, on uh, the simplest possible jet. You well, I wouldn't say the simplest jet because I'm doing shallow water, but um, the simplest jet would be just a a straight jump in vorticity that uh, Rayleigh and other people looked at a long time ago. Um, but if you um, consider the same thing in shallow water. What we're going to look at is basically um, a, the effect of a single jump in potential vorticity in, say, a F-plane um, situation. So we're going to go back, forget that we're on a sphere, go back to the F-plane situation, look at the simplest situation of a jet, and try to understand the associated flow and potentially its stability. Okay? So um, we understand now that the idealized limit, so this is studied in a number of papers, but it's reviewed in this paper here, that the idealized limit of inhomogeneous mixing, so weak mixing and weak damping, where both those are taken to zero um, in terms of weakness, um, eventually leads to um, sharp PV staircases with discon discontinuous potential vorticity. Um, and so we're gonna focus on a single jet um, in shallow water where we have one value of potential vorticity below, another value above it. We're gonna allow displacements to look at stability in a moment. For now, we'll look at the steady uh, flow of a straight jet. Um, Potential vorticity, we, we're going to use the same definition of shallow water. Um, we're going to require that um, the flow as it goes to infinity has to finite total energy, which means that um, the vorticity must go to zero there um, at, as y goes to plus or minus infinity. Uh, it also means that um, since the height field has to go to a constant, the constant values are related to the potential vorticity values that you choose. So there, there's a link at infinity right here. Yeah, well, we, yeah, so the, uh, this, uh, the, if there's no flow, if there's no flow to infinity, Z to zero. And so basically Q is just F over H. H is different because the, there has to be a jump in potential vorticity. So there, I'm saying there's a step, you're going from, from south where it might be lower potential vorticity to the north where it's higher. And the height field is exactly the opposite. It's higher south and then goes to a lower value north. This, it's not a step, it's a gradual variation. It's what's stepping is potential vorticity. So potential vorticity is a uniform value below, jumps to a higher value here, whereas the height field is smooth through this. We'll see what it looks like in a minute. Okay, so Jacques Benest and I looked at this uh, um, back in JFM sometime where we were looking at the 
stability of a basic state steady flow of a straight jet with no perturbation, and then we looked at its linear stability. I'm not going to go through linear stability, so please do not fear, because that would be horrible. <laughs> I can tell you it's not an easy problem. Um, the quasitropic case is simple, but not the shallow water case, but it turns out the shallow water case is boring, which is nice, because it actually turns out to be stable for all reasonably uh, realistic parameters you'd ever want to know. Uh, so anyway, so how do we get the basic flow? So the basic flow is geostrophically balanced. Um, everything is depend independent of X. So it's divergence and ageostrophic, um, or it's ageostrophic vorticity are both zero. And moreover, there's no motion in the Y direction, and all flow quantities depend on Y only. So if you basically combine the definition of potential vorticity here with the geostrophic balance, the gamma is equal to zero here, a, no ageostrophic vorticity, you get a single second order equation. Um, Nathan knows this very well, probably, um, where you get an equation for um, the height field, um, and it's slightly subtle by the fact that you have um, a different uh, constant here on either side of uh, y equals zero. So um, for positive y, you have h plus, which happens to be less than h minus, um, f minus f squared on the right-hand side. So when at, at infinity, dh dy goes to zero, we'll see that that's actually related to the zonal velocity, and you can see that h equals h plus or minus at infinity. So it satisfies that equation. Um, the general solution satisfying the boundary conditions at infinity are something with an exponential, it's easy to work out. Um, and these, these are actually the, the deformation wave numbers, k plus or minus, f over uh, uh, gravity wave speed, which differs on both sides. Um, and this must be continuous at y equals zero. And moreover, the zonal velocity, which you get from geostrophic balance here, because it's proportional to dh, dy, and f and g are constants, that must be continuous. Working through the algebra, a plus or minus has some kind of crazy form like this, not so bad, um, but it means that you can write the zonal velocity as the difference in wave speeds, c minus being bigger than c plus typically for the situation, um, times an exponential factor which decays at different rates on either side of the interface. Okay, and then if you define c to be a mean gravity wave speed, uh, geometric mean, um, then you can write the velocity divided by this geometric mean speed as a fruit number FR defined this way, um, yeah, it's it, with the scaling we've taken, this would be the right scaling, uh, times the exponential of these things. So the, the velocity basically is, um, over C, is basically ma maximally the fruit number at Y equals zero and then decays to either way. So fruit number is the only parameter that controls the solution, the, the, the basic state. What? Well, once you scale everything by C, you can write in terms of the one dimensionless parameter there is. There's only one dimensionless parameter. Yeah, scale U by C. It's the only, well, you have to scale, U has a velocity and there's one scale for speed in the problem, which is C. You could choose either C plus or C minus. You could also take the geometric mean. That's what we took in this paper. And it's kind of nice when you do that. So you can take, um, for instance, look at the, here are the speeds. This is actually U divided by the maximum value which is C times the fruit number. So you can show all plots on one um, diagram. This is Y divided by LD. I think I, L, LD was chosen to be uh, LD. No, I don't indicate what that is. Um, LD is just basically this mean C divided by the F here. So it's a mean Rossby radius. Um, so if you scale it this way, um, then you get the standard case. So when it's zero, a fruit number equals zero is the QG limit. It's the black curve here. And if you look carefully, it, it, it looks very boring, but actually the black curve is the outer curve here and it's the inner curve here. So what's happening is that as you increase the fruit number, say to one, um, it's much steeper to the north and much shallower to the south. So it's just a difference in, difference in deformation length. Um, and for the height field, here it is um, to the south, um, it's deeper um, and shallower to the north. Um, what? This is all in the F plane. All, believe me, it's hard. I, I don't think anybody's done this on the sphere. <laughs> yeah, it can only be this. Yeah. All right, linear stability. I said, said I'm not going to do it. This just gives you a short part of a page out of the thing. It's what you have to do. It's a messy problem where 
You have to do some kind of asymptotic series. You get an infinite recurrence. You have to do something with this. That's never enough. You have to then you know, find, in some parts of the parameters regime, you have to actually do numerical simulations of certain equations. Anyway, save you the pain of this. What you get is that the result of QG happens to be an excellent predictor for the short wave cutoff that you get in this problem for stability um, from, what, from the shallow water prediction, which is the so-called exact curve. And even the WKB limit, which you have to work really hard at using the full shallow water equations, is worse. <laughs> and no, yeah, the Rosby numbers, Rosby numbers related to the Froude number here through this kind of horrible expression here. But basically, um, Rosby number around 2 point something 5 is a Froude number of 1. QG limit's really good, even up to Froude number 1, where you might find shock formation and shell that might not be valid anymore. So it turns out to be an excellent approximation. This is just a zoom showing the, all right, for small Rosby, well, Rosby, Rosby numbers not small, it's above 1. It turns out that above 1, you have instability. That's why we're focusing on above 1. Um, but QG, it turns out to be an excellent approximation. Um, and now, how unstable is a PV jump? So here's the stability diagram. Um, the fruit number shown here, the fruit number of one is here. Um, fruit number of root two, which is sitting here, corresponds to Rosby number one. Everything above Rosby number one, there's potential instability. Below Rosby number one, it's, uh, it's stable. And Rupert Ford actually showed that using Rippa's theorem to prove that. Um, what's shown here are log base 10 of the growth rates. Notice the values. Um, up here is 0.01, and you know, you're up here in very high regimes of, of the fruit number, which are way out of probably use in the shallow water model. At fruit number one here, the maximum growth rate is just over one millionth in, compared to F. So it's not, you'd have to wait around for a million days to see one growth, exponential growth of instability. Instability is basically negligible in this case. So essentially, for all pur purposes, um, these fronts are stable. Um, if you then, um, so then you might say, well, then what's really relevant is since QG is so good, what's the, what's the, what does it look like in quasitopic theory? So in quasitopic theory, I'm not going to give you all the details, but you can go through the same analysis where you find the basic flow. We, we just did that. So you can write it down from the shallow water case. But if we're going to now look at the dispersion relationship, we have to look at linearized theory. So we have to actually linearize this wave. We have to use potential vorticity conservation. We use the inversion relation relating stream function and vorticity, potential vorticity. Stream function is related to the displacement field. And then U and V related to this, the stream function this way. AD now is this, this value here. Um, so now you just consider small perturbations. You expand the, the zone of velocity in terms of a basic state, which is you can write down um, from the analysis before the perturbation. V only has a perturbation. Consider everything infinitesimally small. Um, I'm not going to go through the details. This is all standard stuff you sort of teach in advanced geophysical fluid dynamics, maybe, uh, where you basically linearize the equations. Um, you, you require that there's no perturbation stream, um, vorticity or potential vorticity. This is wrong, by the way. Um, there should be a minus kd squared psi prime. There, I see that. So I'm missing. This, is, this should be this equation here but with zero on the right-hand side in psi prime. This is the linearization of that equation. So you're looking at a Helmholtz problem for psi prime um, with the homogeneous part. Um, the PV interface moves with the fluid with the material curve, so you get an equation on the PV interface. You can linearize that, um, and then you can look for plane wave solutions. A standard analysis, everything doesn't, doesn't, nothing depends on X and T, so you can do that, but everything can depend on Y. You go through all the messy stuff, so you solve the Helmholtz equation, you get exponential solutions uh, of this equation that look like this. Um, the interface equation reduces to a form like this, and um, after you use your plane wave solution, um, we note that the y velocity component must be continuous, and it's related to the stream function this way. K is the wave number we introduced there. And then using the basic state and the, the jump in u the derivative of u across the basic state, you can show that this interface equation um, results in a relationship between the displacement and the amplitude that we don't know for this solution here, which we had to put in here. 
So you couple everything together um, using the last condition, which is that the zonal velocity must be continuous at the displaced interface. This is the only messy part to, um, that would take uh, 10 minutes to go through the details of it, but basically it's a Taylor series approximation expanding everything near the interface. Um, it boils down to a relation of this form um, involving the displacement and the string function perturbation we introduced before. That gives a, um, this, this derivative turns out to be something related to this amplitude we found before. And this relation here just simply tells you that the displacement is proportional to this amplitude, the string function. Combining that equation with the one we found before here, taking these two equations together and getting rid of A, you get a single equation, that's the one we had before, you get a single equation involving E to hat, you don't want E to hat to be zero, and you get the dispersion relationship here. So this is maybe not so obvious, um, it looks ugly, but you can then rewrite this with a scaled wave number, which is K times the deformation length. Um, you can write that the frequency divided by the PV jump is a half times the scale wave number times this kind of weird factor here, okay? Now, it's not something you all, I never remember this, this form, but I have to go back and try to wor work out where in my notes I wrote this dang thing down, but it, it has some nice properties. Um, the first thing to note is that if kappa goes to zero, it corresponds to the bare tropic case, okay? LD going to zero effectively is that case. This term then um, becomes, um, well, actually, wait, no, kappa going to... Hmm? When kappa goes to zero, well, this, when kappa, you have to be careful because you get a long wave theory there. Well, it's actually when kappa, it's actually kappa going to, all right, so LD going to infinity is the bare tropic case. And so when kappa goes to infinity, this term you can drop and you get this one half kappa. It's basically the whole disturbance being swept along with the maximum velocity. When kappa goes to zero, yeah, yeah, right, yes, you're, you're right, exactly. Yeah, minus a half. That's right. And when it goes to minus a half, you're right. Okay. So then, looking at the dispersion relationship, um, all right. Did I then? I wonder if I plotted this correctly. No, no, you're, so the thing is that this part here, multiply this, indeed, the limit is minus one half. But there's this term multiplying this, that limits to infinity. There's two terms. The, the kappa goes through here, that blows up. This goes to minus a half. The minus one half is coming from the classical Rayleigh analysis that we all know for the barotropic case, that you get minus one half of the frequency. Um, the extra factor here due to the kappa is due to the fact that we've chosen to be moving along with the, the point, the, the peak velocity at the top of the jet. So that's, that's an ignorable factor. Yeah. Um, and so that's what it looks like. The frequency over delta Q divided by, the, and this is the scaled wave number. It's, it's basically flat here, rising it's like kappa, and here's the wave speed um, going off to a constant at large um, kappa. So long wave limit's interesting. Um, you actually get that down here, the frequency looks like kappa cubed, and then it turns out you can show that in that limit there's a modified KDV equation that applies, and you get solutions that look like this, um, that form in that, that system of equations. So these are now nonlinear waves. You can actually find a nonlinear uh, set of equations that uh, are an equation that describes these waves, and I think considering I'm now very close to um, having tomatoes thrown at me, if I don't stop, I will stop. <laughs> Conclusions then, so we revisit jet formation and forced spherical shallow water flows. Um, I would argue jet emergence is generic and weakly forced weakly damp flows due to inhomogeneous PV mixing. Every, basically every simulation that's ever been done that uses weak dissipation and weak forcing picks up jets developing in these flows. Um, so like Showman, we tried to use a topographic type forcing to mimic these overturning convective systems. Um, and then, however, we only found that weak forcing or moderate deformation lengths, LB, 
reproduce the locked in non drifting jets that are observed in outer planetary atmospheres, which the model may or may not apply to. So we shouldn't be too worried about whether we get that or not. Um, we think the gravity waves might be responsible for the jet drift in these cases. Um, and finally, um, the vorticity forcing introduced by Scott and Polvani um, only weakly exc excites these um, waves. And that's why we think that maybe um, it's to do with the gravity waves that causes the jet drift. Okay. 